let's get started, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm in um, Vancouver this evening, and it's a beautiful sunny evening. So I want to thank you for joining um, um, and taking time out of your day. My name is Joy Johnson, and I'm the president of Simon Fraser University. And I want to begin today's event in a good way, and it's my honor to invite Elder Margaret, a member of the Laponge First Nation, to offer a traditional welcome to us. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to come to this very special event with the president. And welcome, president, to, to your event. Always good to have you here. You are on the territory of the First Nations, Coquitlam, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tisaiwatus. Just a very quick prayer. Great spirit. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for bringing us together this evening and guide each and every one of us on the path that we are on, especially our families. Thanking the communities from which we come from for allowing us to do the work that we do and our families as well. And a very special blessing on the little ones who witness what we do and what we say. I ask great spirit just to bless each and every little one that's in our, our community and who are with us, all my relations. Well, thank you ever so much, Elder Margaret, um, for that wonderful welcome. Um, I'm indeed privileged to be speaking to you today from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Coquitlam people. Um, I want to also say to everyone watching and listening today that the entire SFU community is really standing in solidarity with Indigenous peoples as we grieve the enormous and really unfathomable loss of life at the Kamloops Indian uh, Residential School. Elder Margaret mentioned the little ones and we remember them this evening, the devastation that's been caused by Canada's residential schools really knows no moral limits. And, as we gather today, I just want to, us all to acknowledge the collective responsibility that we share for a system that has taken so many lives. So um, I'm going to switch gears now because I, I'm also really pleased to be welcoming um, uh, our, our president's faculty lecturer, uh, Dr. Kelly Lee, um, this evening. And Kelly is going to be addressing us shortly on pandemics and borders how to manage travel restrictions more effectively. As you, many of you know, the president's faculty lectures are part of SFU's Public Square, a signature initiative of our vision to be Canada's engaged university. By providing you with opportunities to hear from and engage with leading researchers, these lectures are designed to enlighten and promote dialogue on important issues of public interest. So there's been six lectures in this series, exploring the theme of resilience and recovering from a variety of uh, disciplines. I think it's a really a fitting topic for our time, and I think it's a great way to share ideas and to connect. And we are using the Zoom meeting today, so you can turn your cameras on if you want to, to see, see one another. But also, we feel it gives a chance for more connection in the webinar platform on Zoom. It allows us to communicate through the chat box and, uh, and to connect. So as I mentioned earlier, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat now. Let us know where you're joining from. Uh, it gives us a bit of a sense of uh, who's in the Zoom room with us this evening. Uh, there's gonna be a chance this evening to raise questions and offer comments after the lecture. And I encourage you to do so. You can raise your questions throughout the lecture and I'll keep track of them as best I can. Um, and at the end of the lecture, I'll either call on you to ask your own question or I'll read them out myself. So feel free to type your questions in the chat box and um, um, we'll, we, get, we really appreciate you being involved in that way. I, I also wanna note that we're closed captioning um, this um, lecture this evening. And if you need closed captioning, you can click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Please also note that this lecture is being recorded and will be available on the SFU Public Square website and YouTube channel. I want to remind you um, of our community guidelines, which are posted on this slide as well as in the chat box. Above all, 
um, we really want to promote uh, a really positive environment and don't tolerate um, any discri discrimination or harm towards others. So let me introduce Kelly Lee. Um, Kelly Lee is a professor and Canada Research Chair in Global Health Governance in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. And her research focuses on collective action to address the impacts of globalization on population health and disease. Uh, Kelly was trained in international political economy and public administration. She's received grants from the US National Institutes of Health, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, the New Frontiers for Health, uh, the New Frontiers for Research Fund, the Wellcome Trust, and others. She's chaired a WHO scientific resource group, co-directed a WHO collaborating center, and served as associate dean. She's published more than 200 papers and more than 60 book chapters and 15 books. It's, it's mind-boggling, I have to say. We are excited to hear her presentation, Pandemics and Borders, How to Manage Travel Restrictions More Effectively. On top of it all, I do also want to say that Kelly was one of SFU's Newsmakers of the Year this year because her research is just of um, such um, incredible interest to the public. So please join me in welcoming Professor Kelly Lee. Thank you so much, Joy, and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us on such a beautiful evening. I really appreciate you uh, making the time. And I want to thank um, Elder Margaret for sending her words of welcome. And I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm privileged to be speaking tonight from Burnaby, which is located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Um, thanks, Joy, for uh, a lovely welcome and for the opportunity to give the final lecture of this uh, series, which has covered a lot of different topics, but I think it's fitting that we end uh, summer approaches with travel and uh, border management. So it's a year like any other, uh, like no other, <laughs> I have to say, as, as you will recognize, and it's, I guess, a fitting topic, because here we are um, gathering on lands that we've just acknowledged, and many other traditional territories across Canada and, and beyond. And yet the subject today is about restricting movement across those lands and how we got here and how we're gonna get out of this, this uh, rather unfortunate uh, situation. So what has been the role of travel during this pandemic? How can we make sense of the many forms of restrictions that have been adopted? Um, What's weighing on our minds, I think, most of all is how are we going to get moving again and what can we learn for the next time? So I can imagine these are questions that people have been reflecting on for many months and answering them is far from a simple task. But in half an hour I've been given, um, I'll try and give you a, a reasonably full picture of what has been happening. And like many things during COVID-19, things are still evolving. But I, what I want to try and do is get you to understand what has happened over the last 18 months and what we can do to move forward. So I'm gonna now share my screen. Okay, so I wanna start off tonight with these holiday brochures for the summer, for this summer. And I want to ask you to think about how they make you feel like so many things during this pandemic that we pre previously took for granted, you know, concert halls, parades, large undergraduate lectures, uh, mosh pits, you know, so many things we're never going to feel the same about again, I think after this pandemic is over. Travel may be one of them. So prior to the pandemic, if you look at holiday brochures, generally they make you feel excited um, you're anticipating fun, enjoyment, time away from work. But if you look at them now, 18 months into this pandemic, you probably would be forgiven for feeling anxious, concerned, even a bit frustrated seeing them. And indeed, the subject of travel has become so highly emotional or emotive and, and even sharply divisive. So what actually has happened? How did travel, whether it's local or global travel, go from something that's generally positive to something that is laden with so much negativity? And why has travel become so fraught? Did, did it have to be this way? 
And perhaps most importantly, can we get to feeling positive again and, and excited again about travel? So these are the sorts of questions I'm gonna to try to guide us through in this lecture. And what I want to do over the next half hour or so is take you on a brief journey through the twists and turns of border management and travel restrictions during COVID-19. And I will warn you that it is a bit of a bumpy road. And um, despite announced plans for reopening in BC and other parts of Canada, this journey has some way to go yet. But we can get through this uh, sooner. And what I'm gonna argue is that we, we can do this safely with the right fixes and the right policies in place. So if you're all ready to go, um, I encourage you to buckle up and, and then off we go. So the way I want to begin our journey is really by looking in the rear view mirror and to remind us how um, travel restriction became such a, a fraught topic. So if you cast your mind back to January of last year, when WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern, one of the recommendations that WHO issued was it, that it did not recommend the adoption of travel or trade restrictions based on current available information. And this recommendation was because available evidence at the time suggested that it, that it was unnecessary to, to use restrictions, because, especially if they cause avoidable adverse economic and social impacts, and that uncoordinated use can hinder reporting of notifiable disease events, and they can increase uh, disease transmission risks, and ultimately they could prolong the outbreak. So they didn't recommend that travel restrictions were necessary. And importantly, the recommendation was based on the experience of previous outbreaks that involved pandemic influenza, Ebola virus, um, other pathogens like plague and HIV AIDS. And in this sense, WHO was not wrong in that the use of travel restrictions during those outbreaks, pathogens that, you know, that caused those outbreaks um, were would be an unhelpful thing to do and potentially worsen those, um, oops, worsen those outbreaks. And people began um, you know, thinking, well, that doesn't sound quite right. But um, the, the, this issue is that people can be less forthcoming if you, if you put travel measures in place. And so about a month later, WHO uh, updated its, its recommendations and it, um, it stated that while generally travel and trade restrictions are still not recommended, under specific conditions, it was recognized that they can help prevent or reduce disease transmission. So going from there, what you have is that um, what happened after these recommendations were issued is where I think our journey begins. And by that point already, many countries were not following WHO's blanket advice and had begun to adopt travel restrictions um, quite readily. So the situation had become very uncoordinated very quickly. So what this graph is showing you is the number of new travel measures that were adopted upon declaration of this public health emergency of international concern, and then after the updated recommendation. And then again, when the pandemic was formally declared a pandemic in Mar on March the 11th. And so by mid-April, what you're seeing is the pace of new measures declining, but at that point, that was because most countries had already adopted um, travel restrictions, they had put them into place. So the reaction to that happening, a lot of restrictions being put into place, was immediately quite divisive. So from international uh, legal scholars came the sharpest criticism of these measures. Their argument was on the grounds that they were unsupported by existing evidence, <clears throat> that they were violated international law, and um, this included the international health regulations, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, but they also argued that it violated human rights law and that these sorts of measures would cause major social and economic disruption and hardship. So on the other hand, those favoring travel restrictions included right of center political leaders. So you remember back in the spring of 2020, we had a, a US administration that was all in when it came to reinforcing the US border against certain types of migrant populations. 
So during the Trump administration, as we know, building an actual wall between the US and Mexico was a key policy goal. But also opposed to travel restrictions during these early stages of the, the pandemic were many um, people that were actually impacted by the measures, and that's not surprising. So the airline industry, the tourism sector in general, suffered catastrophic losses. And on top of that, um, groups like migrant workers, international students, cross-border property owners, and perhaps most difficult of all are families that were hit by these restrictions that became divided across borders. So as a public health researcher, for me, this was a really confusing time in terms of what to think about travel restrictions. We, we never really restricted travel on a scale that we, we were seeing unfold and we, we never needed to. And the progressive side of my brain sort of recoiled at the idea that we would restrict population movements. And after all, you know, my, I study globalization and um, fortifying national borders seemed anathema to what I was studying. So, on, but on the, on the other side of my brain, I was thinking, well, we're starting to understand this virus, SARS-CoV-2, as a pathogen and how it's transmitted and how it was spreading in a globalized world. So I felt very conflicted. Um, during those initial months. And as it, difficult it, as it has been to figure out where I stand as a pu public health researcher, uh, I can only imagine how difficult it was for policymakers and decision makers to actually figure out what to do in this situation. Um, because they had to make decisions in real time with imperfect and evolving information uh, and a dynamic pandemic. And they had to do it to kind of weigh multiple policy goals. So they're I, I don't envy their job when it comes to you know whether to adopt restrictions or not. So I very much acknowledge this is a complex issue. It's very difficult to make decisions over the last um, 18 months. But having said all that, um, what we must also recognize is that the use of travel restrictions and border management more generally has been far from ideal. One major source of tension has been claims by some political leaders that travel has not represented a major risk at all during COVID-19. And we've heard federal officials in Canada and sometimes provincial ones claim that travel accounts for a very small percentage of total COVID-19 cases in, in Canada. And uh, this figure of less than 2%, you know, 1.8%, 1%, 1% is, is repeated quite often by people um, in government, but also in the media. And it's become kind of received wisdom among many people. Except that 18 months ago, that should say 18 months, um, SARS-CoV-2 arrived in Canada via travel. Um, six months ago, we had multiple variants of concern beginning to arrive via travel. Uh, in a report earlier this year, the Auditor General reported that the Public Health Agency of Canada, PHAC or FAC, uh, being was unaware that around 66% of people, um, international arrivals who were um, arriving between May and June of, of last year and had to actually quarantine, they weren't sure whether they were doing so or not because of poor records and, and weak contact tracing. We didn't introduce mandatory testing of arrivals um, until January, 2021, and only for some travelers. Um, there's been incomplete reporting of travel-related infections from the provinces and territories to PHAC. And I think most concerning of all, um, a large number of international arrivals by air and land, you'll see the figures there, are actually exempt from any testing and quarantine. So that represents about 700 to 750,000 international arrivals per month entering Canada without testing or quarantine. So all of this is really to say that if you're not testing or quarantining hundreds of thousands of international arrivals per month and have poor systems of contact tracing for the rest, that's an awful lot of travelers you're not actually factoring into your less than 2% figure. And indeed, Anne-Marie Nicole, my colleague here at SFU and I published an article back in February in the conversation which set out why Canada doesn't know how many COVID-19 cases are linked to travel. And shortly afterwards, interestingly, PHAC added a, a footnote to the data that it was um, reporting on its website related to international travel exposures. And the footnote reads that the counts are, quote, an underestimate 
of the total number of cases among returning travelers as exposure history are not available for all cases, and not all jurisdictions have consistently reported travel history to PHAC during the pandemic. So unfortunately, um, that is true. And even more unfortunately, this doesn't stop government ministers and, it, and even the advisory committee last week um, using that statistic still, uh, despite that, that footnote. And similarly, you cannot attend a media briefing on travel restrictions by the federal government without someone claiming that Canada has among the most strictest travel measures in the world. Um, on the one hand, it's claimed that travel only counts for less than 2% of cases. On the other hand, we have very strong measures in place. So something doesn't quite add up there. Um, but, but more importantly, the problem with this kind of self-awarding of a, of a gold medal is that the evidence simply doesn't support it. Our project, the Pandemics and Borders Project team has been conducting a lot of comparative analysis of the travel measures used by every country in the world. And what this analysis shows is that Canada is not really following best practice. And simply saying that it is, doesn't make it true. So the pushback against this evidence of best practice that I've heard is that, oh, well, we're exceptional. You know, we are too big as a country. We're large geographically, our trade relationships are extensive. Our, I even heard our winter weather is such that we can't do these things. What, whatever it may be, it's claimed that we cannot apply the measures that other countries have applied and we're somehow different. So um, the, we're told, you know, we, we've done all we can do. This is, this is it. Um, and then, except again, I think the evidence uh, does not support this. Most compelling of all, I would say, is the fact that we have had substantial and ongoing virus importation through travel into Canada. Um, setting aside the first six and even 12 months of the pandemic, one might argue that decision makers were overwhelmed and lacked scientific knowledge and, and role models to learn from. But if you look since December 2020, when governments were warned of the fast, um, fast emerging threats of variants of concern, there was an opportunity to put into place those strictest measures in the world that, that we, we, we like to talk about. It was like a, a new pandemic was happening. And so there was an opportunity to do better at that point. And so if you look at these, this graph, what it shows is that here in BC, variants arrive and spread to every health authority region within a few months from January where it's zero. And you can see the green line go up, up, up. Um, so international travel brought the variants into BC, interprovincial travel spread them through the province and intraprovincial travel spread them uh, uh, so I've got that wrong way around. Intra-provincial travel spread them around the province and interprovincial travel uh, spread them around the country. And it, there's just no getting around the role of, of travel. And as for the claim of stopping all non-essential travel, which is what uh, ministers have claimed, even this claim really doesn't hold up to scrutiny. And so each week what we're seeing is, you know, media reports of loopholes, workarounds and sheer non-compliance. And for most people, those of us who continue to stay close to home, uh, we're being told that border management is working well, doesn't, didn't ring true. It just didn't feel right. Um, local people, of course, just want to spend time, for example, in a local park with their families. And, you know, they're not looking to, to fly out of the country. And then meanwhile, what people were seeing was people continuing to fly into BC, people from other parts of Canada, or from abroad to come to our province and to ski in our ski resorts and so on. So it's, it's no wonder that people started to feel anxious, to feel frustrated and really to feel let down. It felt very unfair. And I guess if that wasn't all enough, you know, um, to get the blood pressure up um, at a time when I think evidence informed discussions about, you know, needed really about how we get travel uh, to be safer and, and so on, what we saw was really um, uh, the injection of partisan politics. So at a time as say where we needed some really evidence informed discussions, um, any, any concerned voices from the research community began to be shut down by the issue being subsumed by partisan politics. So in other words, you know, the fact that Premier Doug Ford had publicly criticized the federal government's border management policies, rightly or wrongly, um, has made it actually difficult for the Liberal government 
to then listen to researchers who express similar concerns, because it sounds a little bit like, you know, a, a partisan politics um, criticism. So it's very bad timing, because what we do need is an open and honest discussion about the strengths and weaknesses of the approach to date. And, and now it feels a little bit like um, we're, you know, being silenced. So given all of this, it's no wonder that we are all feeling a mixture of confusion, concern, frustration, dismay, even when we think about travel at present. WHO recommendations against travel restrictions, criticisms that travel restrictions violate international law, government claims that travel is not a risk, and then followed by government claims that we're doing a world-class job at managing this insignificant risk. Um, the introduction and spread of variants through travel, despite having the world's most strictest measures, and then headlines about non-compliance and, and so on. And finally, political leaders weighing in on this. It all adds up to a really fraught and divisive policy environment. So was this how border management during a pandemic was supposed to play out? And was this really what was supposed to happen? And of course, frankly, no. Um, it, it, according to the international agreement known as the International Health Regulations, which is administered by WHO, this was not supposed to happen. Uh, it was indeed, um, you know, the history of the IHR dates from the 19th century and its dual purpose was to balance prevention, protection, control and response to international disease outbreaks with um, the careful use of measures those, so that they avoid unnecessary interference with travel and trade. And so you, you, you might well ask, well, why not just the former? Why isn't it just concerned with stopping international spread of diseases? Um, and the reason is that you don't want countries adopting policies in response to outbreaks that are not appropriate or if they're excessive. Um, this is because these kinds of restrictions can have profound impacts on people's lives, on individuals and of whole societies. We've seen this happen. Um, they can cause a lot of hardship and they can devastate economies. And they do. And so, you know, and, and it can cause retaliatory measures as well. So you want to be very careful if you're a government, you have to be very sure when you apply these measures that they are necessary and they are warranted. And so the IHR is supposed to, um, you know, prevent that happening. And it sets out to states parties, including Canada, um, certain principles about when you use these measures. So there's 66 articles in the IHR Article 43 covers uh, what's called additional health measures and travel related measures come under Article 43. And these measures can be used, but they can't be uh, more restrictive or intrusive than reasonable alternatives. They have to be based on scientific principles or available scientific evidence. They have to, you have to inform WHO if you're going to use them within 48 hours and then review them after three months you have to collaborate with other states, parties, and WHO. And then finally, they have to respect dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms of person. So all of these principles are laid out. And so the IHR was supposed to ensure international cooperation. So then we were, I guess, hit with, you know, um, COVID. And uh, we've never had a pandemic like this before. And what we have not had, uh, of course, we've had pandemics before, but we haven't had one with the world is such globally interconnected. And I think this is what the big difference is. And of course, travel is a critical aspect of being interconnected. So if we think back the year before the pandemic, pre-pandemic, 2019 was the third year in a row that we welcomed a, a record number of international visitors to our country, 22, over 22 million visits from people from all over the world. And we welcomed these visitors, of course. They supported our tourism industry, which is worth about $105 billion or one in 10 jobs in Canada. So these, these visitors are very, very important to us. They connected with, with us as Canadians, as family members, as friends, as students, work colleagues. Some visitors became permanent residents or new Canadians to help build our country. And just in general, visitors overall enrich our lives in so many different ways. So this is not, of course, uh, unique to Canada. The world tourism industry actually reported record numbers of travelers in 2019 as well, hitting about 
billion tourist arrivals around the world. And that represents about four to six percent of the world economy. So it's, it's an incredible, uh, it was an incredible year in 2019. And then of course, in spring 2020, 2020, we had to do this. With a public health emergency declared, then a pandemic, flights were canceled, sh cruise ships were docked and then shuttered, um, land border crossings were restricted. This was all done to try and stop the spread of the virus. At first it was thought this would be temporary and then weeks turned to months and now months um, into years. And it's been a remarkable change, a very quick change. Um, I keep thinking if Hollywood was going to remake that old film, The Omega Man, if any, those of you know that film, this would be the time to film it because it's just, um, it's, it's very um, eerie in, in many places. So I guess a quick question that researchers um, have asked, uh, uh, been asked to address is, was this necessary? You know, was, was adopting all these restrictions the right thing to do? Uh, well, there's, there's a growing amount of evidence now. And I think the most compelling is the genomic sequencing data, which now shows that travel has been deeply implicated in the unfolding of the pandemic. This included not only, you know, the initial introductions of COVID-19 into naive populations early in the pandemic, but also repeated introductions over time. So in Scotland, for example, this study by De Silva Philippe and colleagues found that when they sequenced about 1300 um, virus uh, genomes, it was estimated that, it, that the virus was introduced to Scotland on at least 283 occasions just between February and March of 2020, and it mainly came from mainland Europe. Uh, here in Canada, a preprint study by Lochlin and colleagues show that, quote, international introductions and interprovincial transmission of SARS-CoV-2 contributed to the Canadian COVID-19 burden throughout 2020. And so it's clear um, that, that that was, you know, a, a factor. And they also conclude, interestingly, that more stringent border controls and quarantine measures may have curtailed introductions and may still be warranted. And indeed we've learned because travel has been so important to the spread of the virus worldwide and within countries that all the measures adopted by governments around the world in response to COVID-19, social distancing and travel restrictions have been the two most effective um, non-pharmaceutical interventions to control transmission. And so this study by Hogg and colleagues shows that the, using regression analysis that there's a large number of measures you can put into place, but those two are particularly important. And Sigler and colleagues also reached that same conclusion, saying that limiting human mobility to the greatest extent practical will best restrain the COVID-19 diffusion in the absence of widespread vaccination. So we'll come back to vaccination because that's a bit of a game changer when it comes to travel. Um, but remember that travel measures were adopted near universally by almost every country in the world. So why have levels of introductions and reintroductions varied so much? And the, the key simple answer is that countries didn't apply these measures in the same way. They're very different practices across different countries. And so what's useful for, I guess, for researchers such as myself is, and, and our team is that we can compare how different countries have used these measures and then which ones have been more effective at doing so. So this is what I want to focus on for the remainder of this lecture is, you know, what have we learned about the best ways to apply travel restrictions? And we can begin with terminology. What we've learned is there's a lot of talking at cross purposes. There's so much inconsistency in terminology, a lot of imprecision around, you know, what do we do? What do we mean by border management, border measures, travel restrictions? We often hear that term travel bans and border closures. And in fact, those terms are not terribly useful because they are quite imprecise and they can be misleading. There's no, no country really has you know, banned travel or closed their borders. Um, travel continues. And what is key is what they've done is restrict who can travel and who cannot travel and imposed the conditions upon which people who are able to travel uh, must, must adhere to. So usually testing and quarantine. So that's one of the contributions of our team is that we've set out a kind of typology and some ways of Def, you know, definitions that make it clear. So we're talking about the same thing. We can start doing comparative analysis. We can start to um, think about 
how we can then improve the quality of the data that we, that we have to inform our decisions about these measures. A second lesson is timing. So um, our systematic review and others systematic reviews suggested that countries that acted early in the pandemic, so applying a really precautionary approach to travel restrictions, fared much better than those countries that took a sort of wait and see attitude. So it's kind of a snooze you lose type thing, put them into place early before you see virus coming in. And, you know, in retrospect, that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, and hopefully that'll make more sense going forward. But what we've also seen is timing impacts, you know, when you announce a travel measure as well. So if you give people too much notice, if you, you can actually trigger a kind of race by people seeking to beat a deadline when the travel restriction comes into force. So we saw this in the UK in December last year, when they announced, the government announced that most travel domestically would be shut down within 24 hours. I think it was 24 hours or 48 hours. So what happened? People just kind of rushed to the trains, the trains were overcrowded. And actually what happened is this, the B117 uh, variant um, was spread around the country as a result. So, you know, if you impose measures and give people notice, then this can potentially happen. But if you don't give people any notice, and this was happened in India, um, you can cause real hardship as well. So we saw this unfold where, you know, a lot of migrant laborers who were not given any notice at all, were not prepared, were stuck away from home, um, suffered quite a considerable degree of hardship. So that's really important when you're thinking about these measures. And we could also think about, you know, applying these measures at different points in time of year, because there's surges, there are different things that trigger population mobility, it might be holiday breaks, you know, spring break, summer holidays, religious festivals, and so on. So make sure you plan for surge capacity. And then finally, you have to deal with a pathogen that behaves in a certain way. So there could be incubation periods of how long people become infectious and so on. So all of these things, timing is super important. It's not just a matter of we're going to impose a policy and not think about these things. The third lesson I, we would um, identify is geography. So one reason I think often given for why Canada says it can't do more is, is geography. And we've heard this a lot, you know, we're a large country um, and undoubtedly, you know, geography matters when it comes to border management. So how big a country you, you happen to, to be dealing with, how many and what types of port, points of entry, it's very important, air, land and sea, where your country is situated and what, who are your neighboring countries and so on. All of this matters, of course it matters. Uh, so a country like Singapore is gonna have a much easier time managing its borders than Canada or Russia. This is just a, you know, a fact. But I think what also this table shows is that even if geography is against you, that it's harder, it's still possible to have effective border management. So you take Vietnam and Thailand, which is actually not on this table, but these two countries have long land borders, they have a lot of neighbors, they actually have a lot less resources than we do. And yet they have been able to, um, until a little bit recent, more recently, but until recently have coped with, you know, managing their borders very well. And they followed a COVID zero strategy and they've maintained those measures throughout the pandemic. So they've had a very um, positive um, use of, um, of measures. So I think we, you know, we, we need to recognize that geography is important, but it's not overwhelmingly um, a, a constraint. The next lesson I would say, um, and what we are trying to figure out is which specific measures to adopt and when to apply them. So I've already talked about timing, but that comes into play in as well as you know which measures. So one of the tasks of our project team has been coding this massive data set and then analyzing it in terms of you know which countries have adopted which measures over time. So we're mapping a few of the of the jurisdictions that we're using as case studies, and this is um, this is the, what, the graph for Hong Kong, and we're starting to compare you know practices, different practices, different contexts, and hopefully draw some lessons for effectiveness. So thanks to um, Jason and Ray of our team, they created this graphic. Uh, it's, it's all the travel measures that have been adopted by Hong Kong. It shows that Hong Kong acted very early on and it shut many of its points of entry and concentrated its resources on those that, that remained open. So they shut a lot of their 
places that people could come in and then they focused on the ones that were remaining. And if you look at, it's probably a bit tiny, but um, if you look at the specific measures applied, what you see is that mandatory quarantine was introduced for some travelers as early as February, 2020, compulsory testing as early as the summer of 2020, and proof of a negative PCR test also introduced in the summer of 2020. And so keep that in mind um, as you look at Canada. And here what you see is there's been no lack of measures introduced over the last 18 months, as you can see. And thanks to um, my colleague, Julianne Piper, who's put this together with Jason Yin, what you see is a, quite a big difference in what measures were introduced and when they were. So what we see is that proof of a negative PCR test in Canada was introduced in January, 2021. So quite a lot later than in Hong Kong and mandatory quarantine was introduced in spring 2020, but this was largely self-administered. So no supervised quarantine was introduced until of course earlier this year. And um, I'll come back to the issue of exemptions, which were of course a big deal. Um, so that, that's really important. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the need for different parts of and levels of government to work together has been another key lesson. And I, this is one that I think is very relevant to Canadians. So if you think about the movement of people, whether it's from local to global uh, in terms of scale, uh, this should all be considered integrated. All travel should be sort of a seen in an integrated way when implementing restrictions. So the first year, the focus we had was on international borders, which made sense. And we saw some countries like the UK and the US implement some restrictions uh, at their international borders, but then domestically didn't really do a heck of a lot. And that's proven to be uh, challenging. We've seen in our country different levels of government kind of arguing who's responsible and should, you know, the federal government do more and the places like Whistler asking the provincial government to do more. So there's a lot of kind of disagreement about who, who is responsible. Um, and the analogy that I use, and that's why I'm showing this picture of a castle, uh, it, is a, it is very similar to a traditional medieval castle. So if you think about a castle across Europe, you know, they were built to withstand sieges and sieges in a way that you'd had a layered defense strategy. So the outer walls are to fend off those initial attacks, you know, you get kind of moats and towers and drawbridges and so on. And if the enemy then breached that outer wall, there's a second wall and there's even a third wall in this diagram so that you have this kind of layered approach. And you can think about border management in this way. So the outer wall is the international border. And so, you know, we, we, if we effectively use travel measures to identify all the incoming travelers that are infected and we prevent them from reaching the, the wider Canadian community, then we've done well. And always there's gonna be a few that sneak in, but you've got that second wall, which would be maybe like the provincial or territorial borders. And then if they slip through, then you've got your community. So it's kind of that layered approach. But the key point here though, is that it actually makes more sense to keep the outer wall as intact as possible when it comes to COVID-19 and travel restrictions. And this is because that's where our checkpoints are. This is where we have formal borders. Provinces and territories don't have, you know, checkpoints between BC and Alberta, for example. We'd have to create them. And that's a, that's a, a large resource. It's better to keep that, you know, the, the, the virus at all possible, almost like the battle lines at your outer wall. And then the inner walls don't need to be um, moving so much. And we haven't seen that. We've seen our walls breached all the way to the tower in the middle. And that's, that's problematic. And I think the final lesson, and I'm gonna come back to this issue of exemptions now, is that the most effective way from a public health perspective of using travel measures is to mirror how the pathogen infects people. And this seems kind of obvious um, that, you know, SARS-CoV-2 doesn't just infect people who are traveling for non-essential reasons, right? Or they don't, they don't just infect people who have uh, come through the air, but not the land. So we have to make sure that we design our measures in ways that really reflect the risk that the virus poses. And so it's hard to understand then why um, travel restrictions have been applied in Canada in a way that they have. We've have pages and pages of exemptions that have little to do with the virus, a lot to do with economic, social, and political goals, essentially. And, and, and so 
my argument from a public health perspective is that if you want the measures to work and to keep the virus um, uh, out of Canada, and then you need to minimize those, uh, those many inconsistencies, those loopholes and those workarounds. And we need to look at how the exemptions can be minimized. And then those who cannot be, um, cannot be, uh, you know, can still be exempt would be offered vaccination as a, as a priority. So that, that's the, the kind of approach that needs to be, um, be done. So it's true that the measures in Canada have reduced travel. What you see here is, you know, a really sharp drop in the number of travelers coming into to Canada. So we have a decline from March, 2020, you know, when we had like seven to 12 million over uh, uh, the year before, and then we had like this plummet to about a million uh, international arrivals per month. Around half of those are Canadians coming back. Uh, some of those are, of course, uh, non-residents. They'd be coming for what's known as essential reasons. And then there's some little other category, I'm not quite sure what they represent, maybe hockey players or something. Um, so then, you know, why, why are we worried? So it's just like the numbers are so low. Why, why are we worried? And the problem is that still about a million people a month is a lot of people. And as I said earlier, 700 to 750,000 of those are not being tested in quarantine because they're exempt. So that makes it problematic. Um, not every one of those 750,000 people are transporting vital medicines or food or are cross-border health workers. You know, again, there just can't be that many. So there's clearly some people that may be exempted and, and could, may not need to be. So just coming to the last, I guess my last five slides. Well, I'm gonna, um, I guess, really emphasize that well, certain ministers claim that, you know, we have been evidence informed, we have followed the science. It's actually really difficult to see based on what I've just presented to you that we have followed a risk-based approach. We, we can't be evidence informed if we don't have the evidence. And that, you know, it just seems really obvious. But if we have so many big gaps in data, as supported by the, the Auditor General's report, you know, then we, we can't possibly even apply risk-based analysis. So what does this all mean, I guess, for Canada's border management policy um, if, if we're not very well aligned with, with risk? Um, and what does a risk-based approach look like? And I think I'm gonna just spend the next, last part of the, the lecture looking at this and seeing how we can do better. So WHO issued this guideline in December and it was really setting out the first go at trying to create a methodology for um, implementing risk mitigation strategies. So identifying kind of risk assessment and then what does that look like and then how we can use it to mitigate risk. And so it would allow us then to use that data or use that analysis to put in measures that would um, reduce or mitigate risk, but also to justify the measures to the public. Risk communication is a, you know, hugely important when you're dealing with an issue um, that impacts on so many people's lives. So importantly, this kind of approach needs to be transparent. It needs to set out specific variables that you're looking at to assess risk. It has to set out the assumptions that you're making about causality and associations. And um, you need to link you know, variables to outbreak dynamics. And then you need to use these assessments to inform your decisions. So all of this needs to be done in a very systematic, methodical way. And of course, the science of evol is evolving. And there continues to be you know, a lot of discussion about the virus and how it behaves and, and so on. So there will be updates to this methodology. But I think what's important is that it's a recognition that we need a systematic way of collecting data and analyzing data that then informs decisions. We didn't have that, we still don't have that, but we're starting to get it. So using that approach is, is the way forward. And that's what, you know, a lot of what we're working on now is trying to make sense of what that would look like, how, what data we need, what data we're missing, and, and how could that could help us uh, move forward. So what we have in Canada instead is, is very different. And we probably have incidence data, you know, um, a good, a reasonable amount of that. We have a reasonably good level of testing, but not necessarily for the countries where, um, from which travelers are coming from, you know, we may not have sort of that level of uh, understanding of how well is testing going on in other countries and therefore we may not have prevalence of, of 
COVID in the other countries. So we, we can't assume. I think the big yawning gap in data in Canada, of course, and in many countries is travelers because testing is not being done on, on, on a large number of travelers. So we really don't have that data again. And I don't need to go on any more about that. But despite the opaqueness, I think, of the methodology, what I what is I think concerning about the um, the report that came out last week, I don't know how many people saw it, but it, it was an advisory panel that came up with um, what Pres uh, Minister Hadju says is a roadmap of, of getting through COVID and lifting measures, um, which I've, we find very concerning. And so there's a number of, uh, it's, it's not possible to go through the report in detail, but there are a number of quotes there I just wanted to point out because this really demonstrates why I think we need to think more carefully about this issue. So first, the report says that border measures serve to reduce risk but not eliminate it through testing and quarantine. Well, that's actually not true. Yes, in Canada, this is the goal uh, that's been assigned to border measures. But in many countries, such as Australia and Taiwan, elimination has been the goal. And so it's really a choice that you make um, for border measures. It's a political choice, whether you go for um, mitigation or you go for elimination. So it's not a, like a scientific fact. A second quote I've pulled out is that site visits for 121,000 or so quarantine travelers were done. So this is definitely an improvement from how the Auditor General reported contact tracing of quarantine uh, travelers previously. It's improved for sure. Um, and so what we're seeing though is that if you, you know, and the numbers are up, but then there are roughly, we would estimate 325,000 international arrivals each month into Canada that do require quarantine. So we're looking at maybe 40% of people being checked. So I'll let you judge whether you know that's an acceptable level or not. Thirdly, there's a decrease of 41% in the rate of imported cases of COVID-19 from early January, as the report um, claims, and this sounds great, you know, uh, except that this claim is actually based on data, which I've already described is, is, is incomplete. Um, if we're not testing everyone, how do you know that there's a 41% drop? So that's kind of problematic. And then finally, this three-day quarantine and government authorized accommodation, which everyone absolutely either loves or hate. And it's a, it's a, it's a policy measure that has been poorly implemented. So they're saying, uh, this panel, that um, it, it does ensure that some imported cases of COVID are identified and managed before the traveler moves into the community. Um, so the hotel quarantine guarantees that some imported cases are being identified and prevented, but how many? You know, we don't know. We just don't have that data. How many are getting through? How many are being checked? Where are we getting the testing results and so on? We simply don't know. And so I don't feel very reassured by that um, statement. And I guess the most important unsettling part of this report last week was that they've set out these kind of opening, reopening plan. I think definitely I'm just as keen as everyone else to see an opening plan, um, but I'm unsettled because it sets out, you know, what it sees as an effective way to open, but these huge category of exempt travelers, you'll see, you know, like there's blanks along that right column. So they will continue not to be tested and quarantined. There might be some voluntary testing. Um, we, we think that's actually very problematic. Uh, there's no reason why they can't be folded into immune um, status uh, categories. If people are coming in exempt, but they're vaccinated, they probably don't need to be quarantined. But you know, we, we need to talk about those exempt travelers because they are they're, they're a large number. So this is my pretty much my last slide. Um, so we're reaching the end of this lecture and I kind of just zoomed through and um, in a, a very fast time about a lot of things, but I really wanted to summarize uh, ways we could do better in Canada and I think in other countries as well on border management. We, you know, we have to create a, a shared terminology. We need to have an evidence base to guide whether a pathogen or an outbreak requires the use of travel restrictions or not. Not all do. And um, we need to be able to tell the difference. We need to improve disease surveillance so we can proactively or preventively put these in place and not just reactively. We need a forward plan on managing points of entry. We need mechanisms of coordination between our different levels of government. Uh, we need evidence to inform who should be exempt and who should not be exempt. And we need surge capacity for testing, quarantine, and contact tracing. And 
really we need better data all around to, to be collected, analyzed, and shared. And of course, I used to say, it's not just Canada that, that needs to do these things. Um, every country would be wise to implement effective border management during this pandemic. And some have done well, some have done very badly. None have really achieved the final um, point, which is supporting global coordination of these, these efforts. So countries have gone their own way and it's been quite chaotic. So it's chaotic for governments, but it's also chaotic for people, for businesses, for, um, for everyone. So that's not a, a way we wanna go again. So that's a long list. And I believe that each of these tasks though are quite doable. Um, with political will and with the right resources. Um, and then I guess if we do these things, each will help us to feel less confused and less anxious about travel measures and therefore about travel. So each of these will help you know, rebuild that confidence we used to have in traveling. We can move from a position of strength, but we can only do these things if we admit that there's actually a problem to the way we're managing borders during this pandemic. And so beyond the partisan politics, beyond the lobbying by economic vested interests, we really need an open and honest conversation about border management and, and travel measures. And we need this urgently. Thanks for listening. Well, thank uh, you ever so much, Kelly, um, for your um, fantastic presentation, um, taking on us, uh, us on a tour of restrictions and understanding uh, how different countries have approached this, some of the challenges. Um, it's been really enlightening. Um, obviously a very complex area to be thinking about. Um, I'm gonna start off by asking you some questions. And again, I encourage people to put some questions in the chat um, as we move forward. But um, let me begin by just kind of trying to get a sense of what kind of policy impacts you hope to achieve from this Pandemics and Borders project. Um, you know, where do you see this going in terms of kind of a policy frame or uh, a policy impacts? Yeah, great place to start. And we started off this project last March, uh, focused on the specific, very specific task, which was better understanding compliance with the international health regulations. It seems very dry, but <laughs> very important because if you have non-compliance with an international treaty, then, you know, we can't have coordination. And we really, this is a collective action problem. Um, but as the project has progressed, uh, we've realized this is right in the smack of the smack in the middle of a lot of uh, policy relevant debates. At the global level, we've been working with our colleagues at WHO and in trying to inform revision of the IHR, and that's been great. Uh, we've seen our research sort of um, been taken up and, and cited in their report, and it was good to see. So there's some some impact there. I think in more closer to home, we've um, we found ourselves being pulled into a lot of the discussion, the public debate around travel restrictions here in BC and then in Canada. And so what we would like to do is make our findings available, make our lessons available. We're sharing everything on our website and we're trying to engage and we have engaged with government at different levels to, to um, inform better decisions. So if we keep in mind that castle analogy, you know, our research is really trying to be relevant to provincial and local levels of government as well as local and, and national. So we're trying to ultimately integrate effective border management into any future pandemic preparedness plans at BC level, Canadian level, and, and global level. That would be that's ambitious, but this this is a this is what we're trying to do. So so looking at the province of BC right now, um, we you know kind of zooming in um, to BC. It's now uh, announced its reopening plan last week. And what we're seeing right now, Kelly, is um, uh, recreational travel within the province could be starting to happen as early as mid-June. And then recreational travel across Canada, um, potentially by Canada Day, July 1st. Um, what do you think about that? Uh, do you think they're getting it right? And, or do you have some, do you have concerns? What's your, what, what would your advice be? Yeah, um, well, the BC government and the people that are involved in the vaccination rollout, you know, need to be congratulated. They're doing a remarkable job and we're seeing the numbers go down, you know, and, and, and that's great. Uh, we're now back to where we were, I suppose, pre third wave. So that is great news. And I understand totally the desire to restart travel again. 
Um, we, we need to support our business owners. We need to support, you know, people who are hanging on by their fingernails, really. So I, you know, I want to feel the sun on my face and raise a glass with friends and family, just like everyone else. So we're, I'm feeling conflicted. So is what I'm saying, Joy. Um, I think what I hope people will take away from this lecture is that travel has actually continued throughout the pandemic into BC, into Canada, and globally. Um, the travel um, has repeatedly continued to import virus into our jurisdictions. It's like living in a house with leaky pipes. And I, because I've just had a, <laughs> a ceiling problem. I'm thinking about this, you know, it's like you have leaky pipes. We haven't actually fixed the pipes. And now we want to open the tap more, right? So it's kind of that anxiety, like, have, is it really, you know, can't we just fix the pipes first? So how much risk um, are we going to introduce by opening that tap? I think it comes down to how effective those vaccines are at infection uh, control or prevention, but also onward transmission. So that science is still evolving. And the other thing is the wild card, and that's, of course, the emergence of variants and those with particularly with immune escape. So the, the, the evidence is that the vaccines are working, the evidence around the variants is, is far more worrying. And I guess the worst case scenario is that, you know, can really negate those, those gauges. I would say I have a gut feeling that, you know, BC plan is a little optimistic. Um, I think we need to take account what's happening in the rest of Canada and the rest of the world. It's not just BC. I know plans give people hope, they, they are helpful. Um, but I think many of the factors that determine whether the BC plan will work or not is actually not in the good, under the control of the BC government. So that's what worries me. Interesting. Yeah, it's, all, it's interesting to see this kind of rolling out in real time and uh, it's really challenging. Um, I want to turn a little bit to vaccination. Um, we've got a lot of people in Canada now, um, more than half. More than 70% in, of adults in BC have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine now. I'm going to make a little plug here. Everyone get vaccinated. Um, it's the best thing you can do to protect yourself, your family, your community. But anyhow, um, um, but I want to turn to this idea of, um, you know, I know we're focusing a lot on vaccination in Canada, but what's Canada's role right now, do you think, in, in global vaccination? I mean, People talk about where we've heard that it's not over until it's over everywhere, this pandemic. So how do, what's your sense of what Canada's role should be at this time? Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. You know, we're regardless of how well vaccinated our population is in Canada, um, Canadians are not through this until the rest of the world is through um, at, at the end, you know, in terms of vaccination. So as long as the virus is circulating uncontrolled and there are countries without uh, with without uh, with high numbers of, of SARS-CoV-2 infections and rate of transmission continues to be high, and we know it is, uh, variants will continue to evolve and spread worldwide. And, and this, I think, still poses a threat because of the potential, as I just mentioned, about immunity escape, where our current vaccines become less effective. And that's a real concern. So I cannot say this enough, I think, strongly enough. We need to stop hoarding vaccines, just like the toilet paper issue. We cannot, this doesn't make any sense. And we, you know, we need to share vaccines with the rest of the world. And the federal government, I know, has not yet come out to say that it will. It makes some noises, but I think we're, you know, I like to challenge the, the, the federal government to join more than 120 other countries and many organizations that have already backed this waiver on uh, patent protection of COVID vaccines. You know, these countries include the US, China, and Russia, and now where's Canada should be really, uh, you know, at the forefront here. So we're at risk of being on the wrong side of history. If we don't, um, we, we don't need to wait until every man, woman, child, cat, dog in this country has been vaccinated. It's, you know, it's a basic premise in public health population level immunity is in our self-interest. So in a globalized world, the, that population includes every country. So we have to re-engage joy with the rest of the world. And really it's dependent on us to share the vaccines as much as we can. Um, as an editorial put it in nature, you know, it's, it's the right and fair thing to do. Yeah, challenging, it's interesting. So much political pressure at home though, as well as we see, right? Uh, to you know, be showing uh, can Canadians that we are you know develop you know attracting uh, vaccines here and are getting our country vaccinated. It's it's quite interesting to see the behavior. 
I think they're going to be a lot of papers written uh, in the future uh, about this whole dynamic of uh, both borders, but also vaccinations, that's for sure. You know, I, in one of the borders that I think we're all particularly interested in is the Canada-US border. It's a very long border, an unprotected border. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in your view, and we, and we rely on that border so much for trade, right? Um, so what's your mm -hmm. sense of, you know, how are we going to get that border open? How are we going to start to, um, and we're seeing, you know, it's a good vaccine rollout in the States, I guess, to some degree, but what's your sense of opening mm -hmm. up that border? Yeah, and thanks for asking me, um, or not asking me when, because that's really hard to answer, but how is a, is a, is a question definitely we should be tackling now. So I begin by reemphasizing that we need to sort out those like leaky pipes. Uh, you know, we need to think about how, to um, open up from a position of strength, I guess. So if, you know, we, we, we need to have a system in place that can effectively administer any system that's based on immunity status going forward. So the continued, you know, system of exempting a lot of people is, is not really tenable. If we don't fix that, we can't really move forward. So yes, mass vaccination progressing in both countries. Um, there's uh, little reason not to fold exempted travelers, as I said earlier, into um, a, a system based on immunity. So how it would work, so you'd have four, maybe four categories of travelers uh, based on their immunity status, fully vaccinated, immunity based on previous infection, partially vaccinated and non-vaccinated. So everybody would fall into hopefully one of those categories. And the hard part then is figuring out how screening, testing, quarantining will apply to each of those categories. And that's what's being worked out now based on the science. Um, it's looking positive in that fully vaccinated travelers will probably need a bit of testing um, because they still can be infected, but they probably won't need quarantining necessarily, although you know it's all subject to the science. Um, unvaccinated people would then you know, still be subject to testing, quarantine. So we could start with that. Um, selected travelers maybe could be um, that we have are currently restricting. There are some people that we could start to open up a little bit, you know, we see if our system copes, do we have the right protocols in place? And we see, you know, we keep watching, we test and see what happens, how many cases are coming in. Can we then, you know, if we're not seeing a lot, then we would gradually and phase an, an, an opening. So it's kind of like opening the tap slowly. It's not like flinging the door open. So that, that's, you know, really important, but we have to do this in a kind of risk-based uh, approach way. That's, uh, thank you very much for that. You, I will start to look at the questions in the chat, but also to the audience, if you'd like to actually ask a question, you can use the um, reactions button and put your hand up and I will call on you and you can ask your question. Or otherwise I'll continue to take a look at the chat. You know, one of the things, um, Kelly, that's coming up in the chat is this, I, and you're kind of alluding it to it here, but I wanna just kind of, um, talk a little bit more about this idea of, pa of vaccine passports then. So that's basically what you're talking about, right? Is that people would be able to demonstrate that they have been vaccinated in order to be travel, to travel, to have access, et cetera. That's right. It's more like an immunity certificate. So you can, if you've been uh, infected in the past with COVID-19, you would not necessarily have been vaccinated, mm -hmm. but you can demonstrate that you have antibodies, then that also will get you, um, you know, some protection and it will put you in a different category. But yes, if you have immunity status uh, or some sort of uh, way of de determining what your status is in terms of immunity, you have to be able to demonstrate that. So systems that are reliable and valid and you can't falsify, very important to establish. They also have to be compatible across countries so that people can travel and maybe show their um, the app on their phone that they have some sort of technical technological um, proof that is reliable. Um, that's all being worked out. I know in Europe they're they're racing ahead with that. Um, usually the countries that have vac high vaccination rates are the ones that are the keenest. So yeah, I think this is on our horizon. I know that the U.S. and Canada have started discussions about this, and we'll see where it takes us. It's a big it's a big job. I mean, you know we've got a lot to work out before we can get yeah there. It, yeah i just can only imagine logistically how that's going to go and how much work that's going to take it's incredible to think about uh it's interesting though because someone in the chat um um shona is asking you know if we go down this road what about you know equity deserving groups and people who might not have access you know like uh, uh, 
are there downsides to these kinds of you know implementing these kinds of programs? Yeah, and I understand that um, that there's inequities, you know, in who can have access to vaccines, and this is more um, probably across countries than in countries if we're talking about Canada. But of course, you know that we've just talked about that there's vast inequities. So people who have been vaccinated will have more freedoms than those who have not. Okay. That is true. But the the I guess the way I would see it as well is you have to balance that with the inequities that have been created by the travel restrictions. So there are, you know, people who are stranded um, and can't get home from, you know, say Australians or, or other countries that can't get home. There are people who are like refugees on borders who are stuck because they have, um, you know, they're subject to travel restrictions. There's a lot of inequities in the system. You have business people traveling but you can't get families, you know, traveling to for, for important life events. So there, there's there are inequities in the system. And I think vaccination has to be seen as a way of perhaps correcting some of those inequities. Uh, they will create other ones. So there is kind of a balancing act to be done. But I think, you know, we've got to maybe to get travel moving again, there will have to accept a, some degree of inequity before everyone is vaccinated that can, can be vaccinated. Yeah, interesting. Um, one very specific question, and I, 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 maybe there's a bit of a twist on this one, um, but if, if, if test on arrival comes up negative, why do people have to stay in a hotel? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So yeah, but the reason is because you can, you, you often have to test multiple times before you detect the virus. The virus is so sneaky, this particular virus, uh, particularly variants, they can go under the radar. So even with the 72 hour test before you travel, that will collect, find some um, positive cases, but it won't find them all. And, and because you might have not enough viral load in your system to be picked up by the PCR test, then you could get infected while you're on your way to the airport or still at the resort. So you do the test at the border, you may still not have enough viral load. So this is why you need multiple tests. And so the question is, you know, if you do it day one, day 14, day seven, you know, it's kind of, again, the science is evolving. And so policy needs to be where the best science is, where are you going to most likely pick up the most positive cases? Ideally, you want to pick, up, pick them all up. And some countries have tested even beyond 14 days. And so there's also the asymptomatic cases. So the virus is particularly sneaky, as I say, and that's why you need you know, to do all these tests and the quarantine as well. They go together. It's about picking up the virus. And then when the ones that you don't pick up, you don't want them going into the community and potentially transmitting the virus into the community, so. Okay, that's interesting. Um, it, another question, um, and it's really about the Canadian um, response is, in your view, does it, does it make sense that we have restricted flights from India and Pakistan, direct flights into Canada, but not from countries like Brazil? Like, are we being arbitrary or what, what's your sense of, of, the, of that kind of approach? So these targeted travel or they're more like air, you know, flight bans um, mm -hmm. to hotspot countries has been quite uh, uh, politically driven and, and maybe to some extent economically driven rather than risk-based. So if we had all the data that say Hong Kong has, it probably would make sense that you could say, oh, we know that X number of people came from this country and our flights, you know, they have such good data, they can track every case they've had and where they traveled from and they're all travel related. Um, we can't do that in this country. So we're kind of making educated guesses in some ways um, and, in some ways, I call it performative policy because you want to look like you're doing something. People are kind of worried, oh, we'll just restrict travel from X country. But we didn't do it for every country. And we certainly didn't do it for Brazil, as, as we know. Uh, we did for Mexico, for some of the holiday resorts earlier on, the UK. The other thing is the virus is always three steps ahead of us. So, you know, you're fighting a fire, but the, you know, the data is like three weeks old because we have to test and sequence these cases before we know which um, countries are hot spots. And by that time, it's too late. So the, the preemptive or the preventative approach is actually better that you test and quarantine everyone except for a very small number. And then the, the 
by the time that a variant comes along, you would have caught it at the border and not waited until it arrived and then, oh, we'll just slap a, a travel restriction on that country. It makes little sense and it hasn't really you know, been effective. So people travel globally, the variants are spreading globally. It'd be very difficult to kind of geographically constrain, say that variant from that country um, mm -hmm. and so on. So it, it isn't generally a good way to uh, impose uh, restrictions. Uh, an interesting question here, what grade would you give the Canadian government for their handling of the pandemic overall? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, I got into some interesting discussion with the minister, you know, he's claiming gold standard and I said, well, you're more like a bronze. Um, I don't even think, you know, sometimes we even reach the podium. And, mm -hmm. and I think as a grade, maybe a C minus um, would be my calculation. And, and because, you know, we've done some good things, we've recognized now that travel is important, but it, we've been awfully slow about it. And we've been half hearted. And I think, you know, um, lack of effort, if it was, if it was remarking a student, lack of effort, missed a few questions out and um, partial answers. So yeah, I would say C minus, we, we have the opportunity to do better. And, you know, we, we've got the, 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 the personnel, we have the, the, potential to collect better data and so on. So I think we're a potential A student who is not is underperforming, I think that's how I would <laughs> write the report card. Okay, that's interesting. You know, um, you know, another thing, um, you know, people are talking about is like, we're really dealing with two pandemics, uh, you know, the pandemic COVID-19, but also the pandemic of misinformation. And I think in your area, that's kind of also very much at play. Um, and just wondering if you can comment on 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 what it, what kind of a challenge that is in terms of trying to move move this work forward. It's been a huge challenge, especially at the beginning of this research. We had, I think, there, some of it was misinformation from just people using different terminology and understanding what we were talking about in different ways. And evidence of that were what we call fan mail that used to come in and just kind of accuse us of trying to create. Um, you know, trying to recreate North Korea in Canada and trying to turn, you know, the country into a, a big prison camp, you know, and, and really it was, it was really a misunderstanding of what we were talking about, which is border management, never, we're never wanting to shut the borders or ban people from traveling, it's just trying to keep people safe, um, and so on. So you, you do have to kind of um, accept that people feel strongly about these things, and that there's a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, as we go forward, of course, you also hear um, a lot in the media about these people who may not be complying. And you have to be aware not to stigmatize people or to, um, you know, play that game of, oh, look at that person or look at, you know, this group of people and try and understand the, the policy levers you could use to kind of give incentives to people to behave in certain ways rather than blaming. And I think when you get into blame game and you know, you, you, it's a dangerous um, path to go down. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what, you know, that person's worthy of traveling. They could travel, they're essential, you're non-essential. Um, I think we need to just look at this from a public health perspective and see that, you know, we need to keep the community safe. We need to keep travelers safe and, and go from there. I, I think it became quite fraught uh, at, at times. And, and so, you know, we saw that with, with the kind of interaction we had with the public Hopefully, you know, um, let's hope there's not a fourth wave and that we are actually moving towards opening again. And let's see if we can do this in a more, um, you know, a kind of more systematic way. Yeah, interesting. You know, um, Kelly, your, your, your lecture really is focused on pandemics and borders, but it's also really about decision making and how we think about these complex challenges. And just wondering if you have overall lessons in, in ways in which we look at data, interpret it, make difficult decisions that might apply to, um, uh, you know, across areas or apply to people's lives in, in, in other ways. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Joy. I think, yeah, during the pandemic, I think each of us uh, as individuals personally have had to make a lot of difficult choices in how we live, you know, what we do, who we see, and so on. We're just kind of making these these decisions. I think we've been bombard, bombarded with a with kind of relentless stream of new information each day about COVID nineteen, and uh, you know it's it's been exhausting for all of us, I think, and overwhelming at times. Trying to process all this information, trying to make the right decisions for ourselves and people around us. 
um, and, and I think yet yeah, we it's essential that we all needed to stay informed and, and make informed choices. And so I guess I, I had no doubt that as challenging as our decision making as individuals have been over the last 18 months, the responsibilities of public health officials and public political leaders, as hard as I've been on them <laughs> during this lecture, um, as professional decision makers, they have, you know, many more times challenging than us, um, you know, being required to make these continual decisions in real time with imperfect and often evolving information um, and, and on a unprecedented array of issues that you know never probably ever thought about before and, and, and with profound consequences so you know, all of this makes the decisions made I think and when we look back um, we need to keep that in mind we, we you know we need to reflect on how the decisions were made for sure and 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 how they can be better but I don't think attributing blame is actually the right way to go and so to see where decisions could have been better provide more support improve the methodology increase the data, as I was saying, and, and I guess reform the governance systems. I think those are where we need to put our, our focus. And so to me, the lessons are to recognize how challenging decision-making has been during the pandemic on a professional level, but also personal level for each of us, and to be understanding about those challenges. So, you know, also be as hard as we can on addressing those challenges going forward and, and you know, be kind as well. And so future pandemic preparedness is as much about, I think, better decision-making as it is about building new vaccine factories or stockpiling PPE. We have to have better decision-making um, and we need to support each other in doing that. Mm, interesting. Uh, another uh, area in the chat that's um, raised is, you know, we talked about the grade we might give our government in terms of its response Who's get, which country would you give, uh, would, you, would you put onto the podium uh, in terms of their response? Who do you look to? Who, I, we saw a little bit of that in terms of some of the data you're presenting, but uh, maybe, maybe shine mm -hmm. a light on that for us. Yeah, and there's been a lot of talk about Australia and New Zealand um, that for whatever reason, you know, they're far away from other countries or islands and so on. They would get maybe a B plus to an A grade for travel restrictions. They have really had very low numbers of infections and deaths and imported cases. Although, you know, there are some, um, of course, many impacts on, on Australians and people coming in and out, but they, they're often seen as uh, the, the kind of gold standard. But I would say that there's many other countries. So you look at uh, countries like uh, Taiwan, which has now had an outbreak, but they've, they've, um, they're getting on it because they identified pilots coming in and unfortunately infecting uh, airport staff and, and so on. So, but they have had a very good record in terms of managing travel and borders. Taiwan, Thailand, and Vietnam, I mentioned earlier, countries that have, you know, really fearful about their healthcare systems. They could not afford to um, have a large surge of cases. So they really did focus on border management. So there, there's a lot to learn there. Um, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, even um, those countries all, there's many that we can follow. There's a lot of you know variation in terms of geography, as I say, and points of entry, but I think there's a lot we can learn from those countries. They, they should all deserve, I think, an, an A grade. You know, Janice Lee just asked in the chat, I think it's a really interesting question about the Summer Olympics and Japan's desire to kind of land this event. And uh, what are your thoughts about these kind of big events at this time, uh, given some of the concerns that you have? Excellent question, because uh, we're all, of course, looking forward and, we, you know, we can see ourselves maybe gathering again in these large events. So thanks, Janice, for that question. I'm feeling a little bit uh, I guess that conflict conflict again. I was asked about the NHL playoffs as well the other day, and you know, I was like, oh, I love hockey, but all those people going back and forth across the border. Um, I think we need to start small. So those big events, um, you know, we did have the bubble when we had the NHL playoffs last year. I don't know how they're going to bubble that many athletes. There's so many venues, and I know Japan is going through a, a, a major outbreak at the moment, so it's not looking great. Mm -hmm. um, they may have to scale it down, if anything. Um, I know they put it off already for a year. We're going to come up against, you know, two Olympics in a row if we keep delaying it, I suppose. Uh, so I think really we need to take a stepwise approach. I think 
going from zero to a huge event like that is is very worrying. It's going to look very different for sure. The Olympics, you know, crowds, audiences, and so on. Um, but it's important for those athletes as well, of course, to recognize that they've been training their whole lives for this. It, it is a very uh, difficult one. So I've mixed feelings again, Joy. It's just, I think we do, do, do it carefully and we do it in a kind of different way. We might be able to have some sort of Olympics. Interesting. You know, I think that what you're really, um, what, what you're really um, shining a light on is just this tension. And I think this is really about the public health perspective as a whole, right? That uh, it's not, can't just be about disease prevention. It's about kind of balancing out mental health, um, the need for our economy, for people to earn a living. Like this is what makes it so complex is to try to, you know, think through these risks and, and develop a balanced approach. And then, and, and, and then to, and, and then to try and do it, uh, no one has a crystal ball. We just don't know where some of these decisions are going to take us. It makes it really hard. It's incredibly hard. And I guess that, you know, we, we are traditionally in Western democracies, a balance, it is a balancing act. You know, we have a lot of interest groups and we're trying to do, you know, kind of find this, this, this middle ground where we're not impacting on um, people unduly and we're trying to choose, you know, a path through all these complexities. One thing I would say though, that is that the evidence seems to show that if you, if you prioritize the public health, um, uh, managing those travel risks first, countries that have done that and have actually kind of the outer castle wall in a way and gone for the COVID zero have actually benefited in terms of being able to restore their economic activities and their social activities within the castle walls. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a trade-off. So if you keep the kind of balancing act, you actually, these chronic lockdowns and these, you know, chronic kind of restrictions that open and close, open and close could actually cause more damage in the long run. So mm -hmm. there are different models. You could actually go hard and fast and early, um, or you can keep this kind of balancing act. And that's part of the debate is whether, you know, which one actually is preferred, which can you implement in a country with certain cultures versus, you know, political systems and so on. It, it is incredibly complex and, um, uh, that's part of the, what we're trying to trying to figure out. We're winding down and I have time for maybe one or two more questions. So um, for people, if I missed you in the chat, repost it or put up your hand and you can ask your question. Um, but one question that's come from um, um, Anna is, um, you mentioned the team is working with the WHR on ways to improve the IHR. Can you tell us what your recommendations are in relation to the IHR? Yes, thank you, Anna. Um, we are um, really encouraging them to, and, and they've accepted this, that blanket measure, uh, blanket recommendations, the one that was, in, you know, issued in January last year, that no country should use travel restrictions at this time, actually wasn't very, very helpful, because context matters, mm -hmm. and the pathogen matters. So really working with WHO to help them create maybe a decision instrument that says, okay, you have this type of pathogen, this is the context, and countries work through and see if it's appropriate for their context to introduce certain travel restrictions or border measures. Uh, then every country doesn't do the same thing, but it's, in, it's still coordinated because where everybody's working through this decision instrument. So that seems a better way of you know, compliance. You comply because you're using the instrument rather than saying, okay, you can't or you cannot use these measures. And if you do use these measures, you're non-compliant, you're breaking international law, it's too blunt. So we're working with WHO in that respect. They are um, you know, excellent partners, they're open to um, listening. I think they're recognizing that you know, they, they, they need kind of input from researchers. And you know, I've been a big, um, I guess, you know, um, Protected of protective of WHO in, in my other uh, interviews and my lectures because it is a very under resourced organization and if we get rid of it or you know at one point defund it whatever um, we are really you know in big trouble because <laughs> they do things that we um, under the, that we don't realize they do and um, they need to do it better sometimes but I think the best way is to kind of strengthen the organization rather than keep kind of you know, getting rid of it. So I think the same with every level of governance, we need to do better in terms of public health, but we need to strengthen it and support and give better resources. So I'm happy to be working with WHO. It's a tough job. I'm certainly um, 
you know, I think we're, we're, we're starting to realize that from, from this week's, I think, World Health Assembly, uh, that, that that's, that's the way forward. Interesting. Um, maybe a final question for you. Uh, I know uh, the government so far has been a bit non-committal, and there's a question here about having an objective review at the end of the day, um, an inquiry or review into Canada's response. Do you think that's something we should be asking for? I, I do. Um, you know, it's it's not, as I said, a, a, a point finger pointing, finding individual blame. I think I think a, a lot of the things we experienced was unprecedented. But going forward, we are what um, some people say going into an age of pandemics. There are going to be pandemics in future, so we'd be foolish not to learn from what we've done right and wrong during the last 18 months. You know, two years is going to be a long time, um, and there are a lot of lessons to learn, lots of things that we need to to fix and do better. So it's an opportunity to do that. We did that after SARS one, uh, and there were lots of lesson learning there. This time we, you know, we, we hopefully and very much want to implement those, those uh, lessons because this is, this didn't have to unfold the way it did. And so I think really we, we, we need to be better prepared next time. You can only do that with a, with a, uh, that kind of exercise. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think you're right. There's one thing to uh, to you know, learn lessons, but the other, there's a whole other thing to apply them uh, into the future. And I think that we're all recognizing that um, we as a country, but provinces as well have work to do. So uh, it's really, um, really gratifying, Kelly, I have to say, to know that we've got researchers like you who are really taking this broad kind of policy perspective, thinking about the complexities, thinking about what needs to happen um, and, and recognizing. I mean, one of the things I've got to say that I really appreciate um, this evening is that you're also talking about how torn you are. I mean, the evidence isn't always going to be entirely clear about the best direction uh, forward. And I think sometimes we have to admit that as well. And I really appreciate that you're prepared to do that, you know, to say, oh, you know, torn, don't know. Um, we're going to have to yes. make our best, best evidence uh, informed decisions that we can. Um, so this has been delightful. I really, um, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of the university, but everyone, on behalf of everyone participating this evening. Um, I've really enjoyed um, your lecture. I've really enjoyed engaging with you. I think there's a great, some great comments. You got some fans in the chat. Um, they uh, enjoyed your lecture. So I'd encourage you thank to check you. that out at some point. Um, but uh, it's been really um, very, very enjoyable. I also want to take the opportunity to thank SFU Public Square um, for the outstanding event organization. Um, the, uh, the Public Square team has been with me for these past six lectures and they're just outstanding. Um, really appreciate the care and attention and um, just the way they take uh, real, real care of all of us um, who are involved in the, in the Zoom and in these lectures. So thank you for bringing us together uh, to learn and engage with each other at a time when connection is really so needed. Um, I really do appreciate it. Uh, I want you to stay tuned. Um, we begin again in the fall. We've got another series of incredible lectures from SFU's engaged and innovative researchers. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, the best way for you to stay up to date is to subscribe to the SFU Public Square's newsletter. And I think there's going to be a link in the chat for that. So um, thank you ever so much. It's just been a great series. Thanks again, uh, Kelly, for a fantastic presentation. Thanks, everyone, for your questions and comments. Thank you. Really enjoyed myself. So uh, until we see you at the president's lecture in the fall, please um, stay safe, take care, um, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>